Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of DPH Clinical. I am joined by the beautiful and handsome men from Colorado Surgical Institute. And if you guys haven't checked it out yet on the YouTube channel, you can see how dashing these guys are. I mean, Brisky's there. He's got to be sitting so close to his screen. He looks like a ghost. And and now we got <laughs> <laughs> and we got to hear to hear is finally he's in his office and he got off his phone for this episode. So we're happy that he is sitting down and we're going to be able to get a whole feed of video from him. So because nobody calls him. So that's, <laughs> that's how he usually goes. How was your guys Thanksgiving? It was really good. So we were out of town for a week before. You know, it was crazy when I do coaching calls with people who've heard the podcast. They talked about the cruise ship. Uh, incident uh-huh. yeah. that happened. But yeah, so nothing crazy happened on this one. We went out of town for a week and then we came back and we did Thanksgiving at home and just hung out with family. Was this another cruise? No, we went to the, the Bahamas and just like a resort that had like a water park and casinos and all uh, that stuff. Was it Atlantis? No, we went to the, it's called Bahamar. This is the one like right next to Yeah, that's the one everyone says to go to. We went to Atlantis last May. It rained the whole week. It was just a weird week. I don't know. It was okay. Sorry, Atlantis. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Brisky? I did absolutely nothing, which means all of my family is very mad at me what? for not coming back to you Michigan. Too busy? For Thanksgiving. Oh, I, too busy? Yeah, man. Startup and education stuff. I needed a break to do nothing and no one bothering me for a few days for mental health. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, my parents were not very forgiving. They just told me, son, Thanksgiving is the same time every year and you should be. <laughs> yeah. Like, all right. <laughs> All right, that's it's, what I got. <laughs> it's true. You know what, though? So, like, my last, like, two semesters of college, because I was an advertising major, or maybe last three semesters, when I decided I was going to go dental, that was like it for me. And I remember I stayed there every break, and, like, my family was pissed off. And I'm like, dude, I just got to get caught up. It was nice just to not get interrupted. So, Daniel, well, it's not gotta, patient gotta come it's your home, family, Daniel. right? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> no kidding. Okay, so, Brisky, what are we talking about today, man? I want to talk about how to avoid incision openings in a lot of cases, right? Whether it's like a single or multiple or overdenture case all the way to full arch. I've revamped how I do incision line openings and how I deal with them, especially mandibular ones over the past month. So I just wanted to share some of my new protocols and how I do stuff. I think that's good, man. Honestly, when I was placing implants back when I used to flap them, I think everyone's going to say, what did he just say? (laughs) Yeah, I don't flap. So I don't care. I'm I'm old. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm not old, but I'm I'm lazy in my incision lines, man. They just always opened, and I was just like, I'm just not going to make an incision. I'm just going to go right through the tissue or at the drill, and that's how we're going to do it. So tell us what's up, Risky. Tell me what I did wrong, man. If we have, let's say, a single implant or, let's say, one implant or two implants, right? And you place them, and you do a cover screw. What happens a lot of people is swelling happens, right? And then you get an incision line opening. And those are those classic Facebook cases where you see online, the doc says, I placed these two implants. I got awesome stability. I sutured and I don't know what happened. What happened, right? And most of the time it's because the incision opens right over the top of the implant and you get periimplantitis ensues. I know we all think we're really good at suturing, but we're not. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think we could all use a lesson in our own suturing and being very humble and not blaming the patients for the incision line openings, but blaming our own clinical skills. I think is the first thing that we have to do is be very humble. So let's say you do have incision line opening. It's like one or two millimeters. What I'll do is at that point, if there's incision line opening and the implant was about 45 newton centimeters or more, I would just take out the cover screw and place a healing bubble because bacteria can still get to the cover screw or around the top of the implant and you can get an infection and you'll get bone loss around the top of the implant before it even heals. But if it's not, then you have to keep the implant from being infected. And how you do that is I'll give my patients a monojet syringe with closis rinse in it. It's a hypochlorous acid. You could use the same thing with Stella Life or whatever. I don't use chlorhexidine anymore because it's cytotoxic. So I know I use it in my practice. I haven't used chlorhexidine in about over a year now. So you give a patient that syringe. I'll have them twice a day. They'll stick the little tip of the monojet around the top of where the cover screw is exposed and just rinse it right every day. And that will help it stay infection free. What I'll also do is I'll give the patients a prescription gel called metronidazole. It's a metronidazole gel. It's compounded to be more of a basic pH. And the patient will dab that gel on the incision line opening twice a day, once in the morning, once at night. And that will also keep it from getting infected until the incision closes completely, until it granulates in. I don't see a patient doing that. 
I always tell them. Do they do that? Yeah. I tell them to put a little dot on their left hand and then they take their pinky and then they grab that dot of the gel with their pinky and then they go in the mouth and they just tap on it like that. So I show every patient, I make them do it in the chair. I squirt a little dot on their on their hand and then they go in their mouth and they dab it themselves. Do you dab it for them off their forearm? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, this is sorry. This is chapstick. By the way, this is your lips is really scary. fast. Your lips look dry. Also, they actually have uh... <laughs> this next comment. Two things, I, and I might have already told you this, Paul. Did yeah. I tell you like I tried Brisky's wedding ring on? Like he took it no. off for whatever reason. <laughs> this guy's hands are so freaking big. I put his wedding ring on my thumb, and then I turned my thumb upside down, and it fell off my thumb. Dude, <laughs> he has some freaking baseball mitts for hands. Oh my gosh! I know. And two, do fit- yeah, I don't know. You gotta have long instruments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I didn't even mean to like that. <laughs> <laughs> I give it to him nice and hard. <laughs> The IV, I can't remember what you said the other week. Oh, they yeah, yeah. 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 I stimulate them. Yeah. <laughs> if they're not taking it, I just give it to them nice and hard. And I think you were talking about pushing something. Uh, so uh, back to incision lines. <laughs> but Brisky, let me ask you this, man. Uh-huh. You mentioned going in and taking off the cover screw and just putting on the healing abutment. At what mm-hmm. point postoperatively would you say that's like, okay, don't do that. Don't touch that thing. I'd say if it's less than 35 Newton centimeters and you are more than two weeks out from the post-op, then I wouldn't touch it. I wouldn't touch it from week two to week six is where I wouldn't touch it personally. But I would touch it before week two. I would touch it after week six. Yeah, and this is why you see the patient back for a two-week post-op, plus or minus. If it's open, swap it out with the healing abutment, right? Like just fix it before you can't replace the cover screw or whatnot. So make sure you see people in a timely fashion. Yeah, Yeah. Paul, in my startup... I've placed almost 140 implants already, and Holy I've lost God. two two implants so far. Wow! Because I just learned how to deal with how to prevent these complications from happening and how to nurse it along so that way it's successful. So it's like yeah, we've learned kind of all the secrets over practice and education stuff. Gosh, I just remember this happening to me, and I always try to get my like incision more to like the palatal or lingual. So it wouldn't be on top of the implant, but that thing would never stay closed. What do you use to tie it? Like, that's another thing, too. I was using Vicryl. I just felt like I just wanted something tighter. I just wanted something like Yeah, really it, like, always it. opens, right? So that's why I yeah. still advocate for docs to do some sort of paraoster release on it, whether it's with the 15 blade, or you can grab the tissue with your Addison forceps and grab a curette and just lift underneath the tissue and basically kind of tear part of the paraosteum so it closes. But a lot of docs will get in trouble, too, because they start adding things inside the flap they'll say oh i'm gonna not only close the incision but i'm gonna add prf underneath it but if you add prf there's not room for it because how is the incision going to go right back to where it used to be if you tuck something underneath the tissue it doesn't fit so you have to create space yeah yeah i would always just rinse it out with a chlorhexidine and then i just mush my finger on it hold it for like 30 seconds and yeah it didn't work Ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny you look about it. If I'd only known. I don't think they ever failed. I don't think it ever caused fail, but yeah, we lost some bone, guys. Let's let's pull it out yeah, for right? the bone that died. Some bone died. <laughs> yeah. So let's go on to says I know we only have like probably another twelve minutes left here. Well let's start going on to some of the lower stuff. So for an overdenture case or let's just say full arch in general. Our last course, we had two different cases where the doctors did a midline releasing incision. And actually, one of the two opened up and the other one didn't look fantastic either. So I always tell docs, like, hey, I really think, I strongly believe that you can do an envelope flap here where you don't need to make any vertical releasing incisions and you can get adequate visibility and closure. I'll argue that one all day long. (laughs) only time I would ever make any midline releasing incision is if I needed to place a zygoma implant. That's it. Literally. That's the only thing I would ever do that on. Or they have like an enormous, like superfluous amount of bone or those tori and you have to like flap over the top of them. Or they have a shit ton of block rafts in there and you got to flap over an extensive amount of bone that you've grown. It's very few and far between. But I'll also take another stance and I'll say in the beginning when you're learning, you need to see what you're doing. So make sure you can see what you're doing to do it. 
But then the caveat is you got to suture properly because you've made mm-hmm. your suturing harder. And now you increase your risk of incision line opening by visualizing and doing your surgery properly. So with everything you do, there's a concession or there's a, another layer of complexity that occurs. And so we're going to talk about the incision line opening, but just know I'm also of the, an advocate, like when you're training and learning, like see what you're doing too. Make sure you can see what you're doing. Yeah. 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 I agree. I agree. I would still say we really don't need to releasing incisions when it comes to like an implant placement or like a full arch. I really don't think so. Maybe like if you're putting a big lateral ridge bone graft in or block graft or things like that, I 100% agree. I just feel like a lot of docs will get themselves into trouble placing verticals places and then things slough or things patients in a lot of pain, right? And they don't know what to do. So I get a little bit worried about docs placing lots of verticals. Okay. Maybe what we can agree on is do an envelope. See if you can get visualization. If you absolutely can't see what you're doing, put in one vertical release and then Mm -hmm. see what you can do. Yeah, for sure. Okay. And then snap a picture. I don't even know what an envelope is. (laughs) I'm so so lost right now. (laughs) So if you make an incision. I I couldn't even tell if you guys were disagreeing on something. I'm like, what is going on? (laughs) (laughs) So an envelope incision is like a sulcular incision. So you just make an incision in the sulcus of the tooth all the way around the arch. And then you open it up. That's an envelope or a oh. sulcular incision. Oh, okay. I learned yep. something today. I'm still doing flapless, guys. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm trying through it, bro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'm not doing. I'm doing like onesies. You know, it's like I don't know. Maybe one day when we go deep on that, you guys convince me what a horrible person I am. <laughs> <laughs> so recently, I've had a few incision openings. Two of them were tied to education patients after our large class. One was of my own patient. Actually, I had four, four cases recently that I can think of. The first one was one of my arches. I did an upper and a lower. Patient comes back one week, looks good. Two week, doesn't look good. So what happened was he pulls down his lip starting at the one week and started brushing the incision line with his toothbrush. And I was like, when did you say to do that? He's like, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, no, like, hey, like, I told you don't do anything. Don't look at it. Don't touch it. <laughs> don't rinse it. Don't literally, you don't do anything to it for the first time. I love that this is the moment me. this person's like, I'm taking care of my teeth. It's time yeah. to start taking yeah. care of my teeth. I'm going to broke my teeth for the first time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. So it opens up and this guy is a pain in the butt guy. And like I was like, man, I really don't want to tell him I'm going to have to re-suture this. But it was so minimal of an incision opening that when I pulled the lower lip forward, I didn't really see any bone. I didn't see white bone. So I was like, all right, this is going to be okay. If I would have pulled the lip out and I saw a white bone there, I would have had the resuture because I know at that point, biology can attack that bone in the implant and I'm going to get bone loss. But if you really believe that the tissue is not opened up enough and you think it's going to granulate in, then you could rationalize not doing anything. So I chose not to do anything. The next week came back, it looked great. But at his 10-week post-op, he had 50% bone loss on the one implant. I'm like, great. Like, come on. Like, what are the chances of that? So this is one of the two implants I had failed in my practice. So I just took it out, grafted it. I had five other ones, so I didn't even place another implant. But we just continued moving on. But I still, to this day, will advocate for docs to re-suture everything (laughs) when it comes to these things. Because the risks of leaving these open and getting implantitis or bone loss around an implant you just place is far greater, at least for me, than letting it just granulate it. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Ty here doing with Colorado Surgical Institute. Dr. Brisky and myself have really enjoyed doing these podcasts with Dr. Etch and talking about everything clinical. So keep your guys' feedback coming. It really helps us curate what we're going to be talking about on the podcast. If you want to learn how to do live patient surgeries and actually do the work yourself with the guidance of Dr. Brisky and myself, come out and see us. We're in Northern Colorado. We're just North of Denver and we can have you do anything from single implants to wisdom teeth, to IV sedation, to oral sedation, bone blocks and GBR and sinus lifts, vertical and lateral and full arch with the whole digital workflow using photogametry, 3D printers, mills, and all of the above. So we're here to help. Reach out to us. You can call Chris Richards, our director, at 970-420-6148, and he will definitely have a hero discount for you guys because we love Paul and we love DPH. 
And you have to be very careful when you resuture it because the tissue is like immature tissue and post-surgical tissue is very friable. And like you pull on it, you're going to start tearing it and it's going to be a big old mess. So just make sure you're very, very careful with it. I was looking for this picture. This is a picture and you can't really see it well. I got texted. He's 87. His daughter's pulling. He has dementia. The daughter's pulling the lip out to take a picture of it to send it to me. And I texted her back. I was like, hey, everything looks great. Stop pulling on his lip, please. (laughs) <laughs> Let's not do that again. Like, <laughs> the whole lip is pulled out to take the picture. I was like, that picture to show me how it's going could have like ruined the whole case. Don't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah. you have to be very clear with people about incision line opening and how to like manage this stuff after the fact. Patients just do the weirdest stuff. Yeah. Why? Human beings are not. So, I mean, I think we're too, but yeah. Yeah. So in those cases, like the one I had, what I did was I actually, because I didn't see too much of a bone opening, I gave him, oh, sorry, I brought him back every two days and I rinsed it and I applied that metronidazole gel myself. Just a little dab for To you. see if I could nurse it along, right? And it looked like it healed great. But I wasn't going to give him the gel because he would have done what Dr. Dune just showed and pulled his lip down and like would have ruined it even worse, right? Yeah. So Put it on your I should have that one. <laughs> Put it on your forearm and dab it in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. I love this episode already. (laughs) So the worst one I've ever had, dude, and this one rivals that Randy patient. Randy? Randy? Yeah. I actually just fixed his case. We finally got him healed, what, two years later with everything? So that was probably one of the worst ones ever. Is Randy a party dude? I've never met a Randy dude. Somebody named Randy that doesn't party. Not party. He's like a 50-year-old alcoholic that chugs bourbon while watching The Price is Right. You yeah, know, that's the kind of Randy I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah that, um, that's Randy. Randy. That's Randy. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, Brisky. No, 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 what happened with good, Randy? I want to hear more about Randy. Randy got really drunk every night and would literally just pull his lip down and fuck around with sutures. And he would call me like, hey, man, like, I don't remember doing this, but I did it. And then I was like, all right, all right Randy. <laughs> he feels accountable. Let's resuture it. But then we realized that he was an alcoholic. He just didn't tell us. So he opened it. Then we closed it. Then he opened it. Then I closed it again. And the lower stayed closed. I was like, oh, my God. Thank the Lord that the lower stayed closed. The upper opened. Then we closed it. Then it opened. And he got parimplantitis and three millimeters of bone loss in all his implants. So we took out all the implants. Holy and cow. then after we took out all the implants, he developed an oral antral fistula. So I went back in, we tried to close that. It looked good for a few weeks. Then it came back and there was still another oral intrafistula and it's just on and on. And yeah, still going? finally this guy got an upper arch. It's closed. And then we redid the arch and then we put in pterygoids and four in the front and all the implants were engaging the nose and we got the pterygoids to be stable and we didn't make any incisions around that oral antral, antral foot fistula, so it's closed. And now he's in upper and lower temps. And all of that to say is make sure you ask your patients about like, hey, like, are you drinking even a little bit? People offer up like, oh, yeah, sometimes here and there. Some people are like, yeah, you know, I like a drink every single night. You know, socially I like a couple of beers. alone. Yeah. And yeah socially, alone. Socially, alone. socially yeah. by myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so just be careful. Yeah, sometimes saying no to someone is important too. But Randy yeah. is moving in the right direction and we're making him prove with alcohol tests before he comes into every appointment that he's staying clean. He looks healthier. I mean, before he'd come in pale, now he has some color to his skin and he's looking way healthier. So you think know. going through this procedure is what partially helped him get clean? Partially, because all the yeah. failures and surgeries and expense and everything, like it'll open your eyes for sure. Yeah. Man, that's an unusual rock bottom, but I guess it works. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Nice job, Randy. You keep going, buddy. <laughs> one of the worst ones I had that rivaled this one, I had a lower arch patient, and this is Polish lady, speaks a like, decent amount of English, but we did a lower arch. is just four implants because it's literally all that she could have. So I placed four implants. She comes back five days later, and incision opening. I was like, what are you doing? So we just kind of went through everything. It was like, hey, don't touch it. Don't look at it. Do anything. She told my assistant that because it felt painful, she would pull her lip down and put that jelly stuff from the store, Orogel, Orogel yeah, on it. She would pull it down and put Orogel there because it was sensitive is what she said. 
And I was like, well, what about the fact that we said, don't look at it, don't touch it, don't do anything. Did you remember that? And she's like, no. Like, all right, well, shit, let's reclose this. So I reclosed it and it looked fantastic. I took a video of it, how I reclosed it so I could show people like what I do. We released a tissue, a crap ton. I put a layer of PRF over all the implants. I reclosed the entire thing. She comes back another five days later. It's open again. So I found out. She told me that she didn't do anything, but she disclosed to my front desk that she was brushing it and that, what else? She was doing something else to it as well, but she opened it a second time. So I reclosed it a second time. This time there was really not much to work with at that point. I released the tissue like crazy. I put two layers of PRF over the top of each implant because the first one can resorb. The second one will actually stick around. So that would be my best bet is to at least have one of the PRF stick around long enough to help the implant not fail. And then I put glue stitch, <laughs> like stitch mm. glue around the incision line and I glued it to the prosthetic and her lip. <laughs> and she came back another three days later and it was mostly closed, like 80%. I couldn't see the bright white bone, but I could see the tissue like grinning it enough. So I've been seeing her every two days to just rinse it and apply antibiotic gel to just nurse it along. So what I wish I would have done on this one, there is a common pattern of the three patients that I'm thinking about in my head, and it's actually been the muscle. It's the mentalis muscle and then the DAO muscle. It's like the something angularis oris right here, this muscle, and then the mentalis. All three of the patients were a lower all in X or a lower over dentures. And all of them had a hyperactive mentalis muscle. So they clinched their chin here and you can see an orange peel, right? It looks like an orange peel chin. So now <laughs> what I'm starting to do is anyone with an orange peel chin <laughs> will get Botox minimally 10 days pre-op from oh. their overdenture case or their all on X case. And I'm putting three units like in a triangle, like one, two, three on the mentalis. But then there's also an area called P5. It's where the DAO meets like the DLI muscle. And what it is, it's the safe area to inject Botox where you won't get a lip drop like this, basically, mm. is what that means. And I pick, there's a spot right here and right here. And then I also give one unit, four of them, right on the lower lip. Not many units, really. It's like 12 units total. But I do that 10 days pre-op and the patients come back, their chin's tight, their lip is not sagging, but they can't flex it. So at that point, those patients with the hyperactive mentalis muscle cannot destroy my incision openings. Wow. That's quite a protocol. You know what I noticed, Brisky, is, and I'm going to share this for listeners who can't see Brisky. When Brisky points at things like muscles in his face, he uses his index finger. But when he talks about <laughs> applying anything, that pinky comes out. <laughs> he sticks his pinky yeah. in the air. And I think that's just a testament to how big Brisky's hands are. He's like, if it's going in the mouth, it's got to be a pinky. But if it's outside here, we're going to use our finger. Yeah, I'm paying attention. What you guys got coming down the pipe? I mean, this one's going to be coming out right around end of the year. What's going on for 2024 for Colorado Surgical Institute? Things are just picking up. So we do have our single implant course. We have our wisdom tooth course. We have our full arch course where we do six implants. We talk about block grafts and we'll actually do block grafts. We'll do lateral sinuses. And when I say we'll do, I mean the attendees who sign up for the course will do the procedures themselves. And Dr. Brisky and myself will provide the patients or you can bring your own patients. And then we have IV sedation. And the cool thing about the IV sedation thing is, is it's online for the first two courses. So you can start now start to do all that stuff at home so you don't have to come out in two separate weekends to do all your didactics and PowerPoint quizzes and all of that. And then you have two sessions in office with us on two separate weekends where you get ACLS certified and then just do your live patient clinicals. And the cool thing is the live patient clinicals are done on our wisdom tooth and implant patients. So it's not going to be done on like fillings and stuff like that. Like the vast majority of the cases you're going to sedate are surgical patients Every once in a while, you got to do an extraction and bone graft or something like that. But it's all really representative of what IV sedation is meant for. And that's why I just like the program. It's a really cool one. That's awesome. When is the best time of the year to come out to your neck of the woods? Man, I guess if you like skiing, if you're like brisky, like that dude, I mean, owns all the mountaintops, like I would come out in the winter. So we have like February and March courses, because then you can just go swing up to one of the mountains and go have a good time. And we have what, 14,000 feet elevation ones. I don't know how high Winter Park or some of these are. Are they 12, 13? Breck goes up to 13,400. That's the highest wow. one with a lift yeah. in North America. 
In yeah. Wisconsin, there's one that's 270 feet. <laughs> so just for comparison, we're talking about 13,000 foot difference in the mountains here. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, check out coloradosurgicalinstitute.com. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks, man. Yeah, thanks, man. Hey, everybody. This is Dr. Doon from Colorado Surgical Institute. Just wanted to give you guys a shout out and let you know about the program. We have full arch surgeries. We have lateral sinus lifts. We have block grafting courses all done in one weekend with the whole digital workflow with photogammetry units, scanners, 3D printers, milling, you name it, anything regarded to full arch, we cover in depth. We also have a PGCA course. What that is, it's the Postgraduate Clinical Accelerator course where we are going to be covering wisdom teeth, single implants, and it can be complex single implants with vertical sinus lifts. We'll also be covering full arch extractions with ridge reduction, bone grafting, PRP, suturing, and we also will have a course on socket preservation. So if you guys are interested in any of those courses, please reach out to us at Colorado Surgical Institute. The code is here.